And everyone, I'm just, there we go. Let me get my sound level balanced here. Right, welcome to the last lecture of the week. For me, uh, for some of you, you're staying on for one more after this. I think few of you are going to Shazreen's lectures. But we are, summer school's winding down. Do you know there's a concert at four o'clock? Do you want me to finish at one minute to four? <laughs> well, I've had a couple questions I'd like to address before we start the lecture. I've been asked about, oh, here, about resources for the stellar music I talked to you about yesterday. And the man who produced the movie on the trip to Orion is called Zoltan Kolat. Oh, that didn't help you. I don't have his name up there. Let me put it up. Just sit there for a moment because some of you might want to write that down. Oh, well, um, I forgot about how slow this thing is. That's a new slide, and we can just pop his name in here. Ah, except that that's not a semicolon, that's an L. And there's only one. There we go. So Zoltan Kolat has a website called the Stellar Music Project. He's a professional astronomer, but he has worked on the stellar music with his friend, the composer, Jena Koehler. And so this is his website, Zoltan Kolat Stellar Music Project. And over here, if you click on these, you will find some of the material I showed you, the, the horn that played Bach, the trip to Orion. And for some of their really long compositions, they have written uh, papers, write-ups for musical conferences where they talk about the classical music conventions that they used to make the composition using stars. And so if you are musicians or musically inclined, there is a resource for you for that. I was also asked yesterday about where the elements come from, and I promised I would find the periodic table from Jennifer von Satters, or just sorry, Jennifer Johnson from Ohio State University. Uh, she has made this up recently. I discovered that one of my fellow graduate students at the University of Texas, Jim Latimer, who got his PhD at the same time as me back in the early 1970s, actually figured this out as part of his PhD thesis, and he got ignored until about two years ago, and now his thesis is the definitive description of where elements come from. We used to think that everything heavier than iron came out of supernovae explosions. It's now thought that much of it comes out of colliding neutron stars. And the colliding neutron stars were discovered in gravitational waves two years ago, leading to the Nobel Prize for the discovery of gravitational waves. So for this, HR, for this periodic table, Big Bang produced hydrogen, helium, and a tiny bit of lithium. Low mass stars that just blow away their atmospheres as planetary nebulae are producing things like carbon, nitrogen. Oxygen's coming out of exploding supernovae. And things like the gold you're wearing here looks like it comes out of these colliding neutron stars. So that table gives you the best estimate. Where can you get that? If you just look up Jennifer Johnson periodic table, I'm sure you'll find it. But an excellent resource for astronomy in general is called the Astronomy Picture of the Day, APOD. And every day, there's a nice picture and a very short description from two NASA scientists with links to more material. For you to find more information on all the things I'm talking about in general, I have to tell you that's not so easy. I've gathered a lot of the material that I provide to you from many different sources. That's true for today, too. And there is no single place you can go off and read about it. And I don't plan to write it up. And so the solution to this is, is come back to my lectures next time I come. <laughs> it's about time. If you would like to see a bunch of physicists squirm, the next time you go to a party full of physicists, do you do that? <laughs> Happens to me. Say to them, what really is time? What is it? Haven't you lain awake at night many times worrying about that? It's a big puzzle. Do you think of the future and the past as having an existence? If you like to imagine time travel, then in some way you seem to think the future and the past are out there somewhere 
in space-time. That may not be true. It may be there is only ever the infinitesimally thin instantaneous present, and it's the fact that there is change that gives us the sense of time. I can't answer this very well. In fact, I find it so puzzling, I decided I would have my dictionary help me. I went to my dictionary and looked up time, and it said it's a measured or measurable duration. I didn't feel very enlightened, so I thought, well, let's look at duration, and I find the dictionary defines duration as time. And it has helped us in no way whatsoever. Well, this problem is old. It's often called the Augustinian dilemma, because Augustine thought about this. Now, I'm calling him Augustine because of, he obviously was not Saint Augustine when he thought about this. You have to die to be a saint. So while he was alive, he said, what then is time? If no one asks me, I know what it is. If I wish to explain what it is to him who asks me, I do not know. And I'm with Augustine. And so that's not what the lecture is about today. <laughs> the lecture today is about the measurement of time. And that I do know a considerable bit about. And there's lots of nice stories <clears throat> that come out of our effort to measure time, to quantify it, and to keep track of it, particularly with calendars. So the day, the month, and the year have all got astronomical origins. But for many of you, perhaps most of you, they are not quite what you think they are. The week has got a semi-astronomical origin, and I'll tell you how the days of the week got their names. It's a cute story, and once I've told you, you'll be able to tell your friends too. You will see the pattern. Hours, minutes, and seconds are purely invented. This is the beautiful plafond, the, the ceiling in the main council room of the Observatoire de Paris, which I showed you in the first lecture when I talked to you about uh, the history of science. And the ceiling shows the sun being pulled across the sky by a chariot, classical myth, with Venus passing in front of the sun. There's the transit of Venus that I talked to you about earlier. And down here is some cherubic astronomer watching Venus pass in front of the sun. So the day is the time it takes the Earth to turn on its axis once, right? Not quite. So let's do just a little bit of astronomy. Mostly we're doing history today. Schematically, there's the sun with the Earth orbiting about it, not to scale. And the arrow indicates the time of day when it's noon. Now, here in Cape Town, the sun never gets to the zenith. We're south of the Tropic of Capricorn. But noon's when the sun is, high, is as high as it gets. When the Earth rotates once, it's turned 360 degrees. It's also orbited the sun. One degree, and that's not a coincidence. And at that point, with the 360 degree turn, here we are, we're not pointing at the sun, it's not noon, the Earth has to turn a little bit more. And so the 24 hours that we put on our clock noon to noon is a little bit more than the time it takes the Earth to turn on its axis. I'll tell you how to calculate how long it takes the Earth to turn. If you wait three months, the Earth now has to rotate an additional 90 degrees to get back to noon. After six months, it has to rotate an additional 180 degrees, and you can see after a year, there will be one full 360 degree turn missing. So there are 365 and a quarter days in a year. There are 366 and a quarter rotations of the Earth, exactly one more. And if you multiply by that ratio, you find the time it takes the Earth to rotate is 23 hours, 56 minutes, 4.1 seconds, and lots more decimal places. We call that a sidereal day, a day by the stars. The month and the year, you think the month is the time it takes the moon to orbit the Earth? No. The year is the time it takes the Earth to orbit the sun? Not the year we put on our calendar, not quite. And we'll come back to those. When does a day begin? Midnight? Just by convention. Why do we start a day at midnight? Well, for this audience at least, because for all of us, come midnight, we've gone to bed, we're not working. How inconvenient would it be if in the middle of the day we decided to change the date? If back when you were working, you're keeping track of things, and when noon comes, it's no longer the 25th, it's the 26th of January. You can imagine the confusion. So change the date in the middle of the night when most people won't be impacted. But other societies do things differently. As astronomers, we work through the night, so we'd like to change the date in the middle of the day. 
And English astronomers created a system like that centuries ago when they were observing from England, and it helped for a while, but we observe all over the planet now, and that's not done us any good. In Kenya, on the equator, in Ethiopia, near the equator, they start their day at sunrise, and they count 12 hours till sunset. The day, length of the day doesn't change if you're on the equator. Every day is 12 hours, every night's 12 hours, and they just start from sunrise. And of course, Jewish Sabbath this evening will start at sunset because before the invention of clocks, how do you know when the Sabbath starts? Watch the sun go down, and in the Middle East, you can do that very easily. Um, it wouldn't work so well in England. I gave a lecture last March at the Ethiopian Space Science Telescope Institute, or for them, at a local school where they had four schools come, and they scheduled it for 10 to 11. And you can see the time scheduled here, 10 to 11 local time. But they start counting zero at sunrise. That's 6 in the morning on our clock. And so 10 o'clock on their clock is 4 in the afternoon. And because I'm giving the lecture, they stuck that in for extra information so I knew when to come to the lecture. The length of the day is not constant. The Earth speeds up and slows down. One of the major effects is tides. When the moon and the sun are in the same direction or opposite directions in the sky, the tides pull out and the Earth is spinning and angular momentum is conserved. Think of me as an ice skater here. You've watched ice skaters. The ice skater starts to spin with her arms out and she pulls them in and spins up. You can put them back out and slow down again. So angular momentum is a measure of how fast something's turning and how far away it is from the rotation axis. When the tides go out, the Earth slows down. And then a week later, when the moon's 90 degrees to the sun and the tides pull in, the Earth speeds up. And it's a huge amount, as you can see. It's about a thousandth of a second per day. And you say, who cares about a thousandth of a second per day? Well, if you're worried about your GPS, where your car is, where your military machines are. If you're worried about GPS, you carry about a thousandth of a second of a day. But I told you about pulsars spinning up to 760 times per second. They spin in a millisecond. As an astronomer doing radio astronomy with the square kilometer array looking at pulsars, if we lose track of a thousandth of a second, we lose track of a whole rotation. We really get confused. We care about that. The Earth's rotation speeds up even more because of the seasons. You may know the land mass on the Earth is not equally distributed. Most of it's in the northern hemisphere. And Africa's huge. Africa's 20% larger than all of North America. That includes Canada, Greenland, Alaska. Mercator projections completely distort your view of the planet. And yet most of Africa's northern hemisphere, the equator cuts down below the bulge. South America is not so big. And so as the seasons change, the winds blow. The winds carry spin. And they take that spin from the Earth. If they go to the east, the Earth slows down. If they go to the west, the Earth speeds up. It's all got to be balanced. And that changes the length of the day by as much as 25 thousandths of a second a day. Now, we've got an effect we call the quasi-biennial southern oscillation. Every couple of years, the Pacific Ocean heats, and the currents start to flow to the east up against South America. That typically happens in December, late December. And those warm currents flow up into the cold water of the Humboldt current, and they carry angular momentum to the east, and the entire Earth slows down. Its rotation changes. And we astronomers can see the Earth slowing down, and we know at that point the El Nino is coming. Come back here, El Nino, where are you? There. Why El Nino? Well, Nino is just Spanish for boy child, but with a capital N, it means the Christ child. It's because the event comes late December into Chile. So we can measure the El Nino coming just from the rotation of the Earth. And here is a plot of what the Earth's rotation has been doing since the 1960s, 65, 70, 75, 80. Here we go up to almost the present. This is 86,400 seconds per day. That's the 24-hour day. And up here is one millisecond to three thousandths of a second too fast one thousandth of a second too slow, and the Earth rotation goes up and down every year. As the seasons change and the winds blow on the northern continents, it, there's a seasonal effect. You can see the annual effect, but you can see that the Earth's rotation is wiggling around rather unpredictably. The Earth's rotation is not a good clock. And so the, your clocks are not running on Earth rotation time. They're running on atomic time. 
and atomic time is precise to a part in 10 to the 16 now. These are leap seconds that we add to the clock to keep the Earth's rotation synced with our atomic time, and I'll come back to the leap seconds. There's a real picture of the Earth and the Moon. This is not photoshopped. This is taken from an Earth observation satellite, excuse me. <clears throat> and there you're looking at the far side of the Moon, which is not what we see from the ground. Notice the difference in the size of the Moon and the Earth. Moon's much smaller, much, much darker. If I were to ask you what color the moon is, before I showed you the picture, you would have told me it's silver or it's golden. The moon's black. It's covered in basaltic lava. It only reflects 12% of the light that hits it. The Earth reflects about 69% with all these white clouds and blue oceans, much, much brighter. The Earth and the moon are interacting because of tides. And with time, ocean tides and Earth tides are causing the Earth to slow down. The day is getting longer. The moon's drifting farther away. This is not just theory. We bounce laser beams off, the, off retro reflectors, mirrors left on the moon, and we can measure the distance to the moon to a precision of two centimeters. And it's drifting away from us by four centimeters per year. It's a big signal over the decades we've been doing this. The telescopes on different continents are moving apart or together because of continental drift. That changes their, their distance to the moon, and we can measure continental drift. We can measure the speed with which Africa and South America are separating by this project of looking at sending laser beams to the moon. So as the day gets longer and it stretches, we're adding leap seconds when necessary to keep the clock synchronized, and we call that intercalation, putting something into the calendar. You think of the day as being stable, but let's take our favorite park, Kruger Park, and all the ecosystem that's there, the animals that live there, they have a circadian rhythm just like ours. They live on a 24-hour day. But if you could go back to the Cretaceous and go to Kruger Park, it was there. Go up to Barberton, there are rocks four billion years old sitting on the surface of the Earth. Go back to Kruger Park at the end of the Cretaceous when the dinosaurs dominated, and the day was not 24 hours, it was only 23.7 hours, and then work your way back through the geological periods, back here to the time when life first came out of the ocean and exploded onto the land, the day was only 21 hours long. What would happen to you if the day turned to 21 hours right now? That means you got up this morning, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, 7 o'clock you got up this morning, tomorrow you get up at 4 a.m., the next day you get up at 1 a.m., the next day you get up at 10 p.m., and just a few days you're going to be ill. And if you keep doing that, you may not actually survive. But this happens so slowly that life adapts to it by evolution. The ultimate fate for the Earth is to get fixed on about a 40-hour day, much, much slower, before the sun destroys life here on the Earth. Now, I'd like to take you back about 3,500 years to the Babylonians. Uh, there's a beautiful exhibition on the British Museum right now called I Am Ashurbanipal about the great emperor of, of Assyria, even before the Babyloni Babylonians, uh, who pretty much ruled the biggest empire in the world. Well, the Babylonians nowadays get very bad press. This is modern-day Iraq, but they've got an illustrious history. And they are the ones who divided the day and the night into 12 hours. They had a counting system where they didn't count 0 to 9 and then carry a digit for 10. They counted 0 to 11 and carried a digit for 12, and it is far superior. You yourself buy eggs by the dozen. You buy donuts by the dozen. You can share a dozen equally with two friends, three friends, four friends, six friends. Ten's harder to divide up. So it would have been better if we'd have stayed with a, a base 12 counting system, and it looks decimal. There's no problem doing the arithmetic. Anyhow, they divided the day into 12 hours, and the day had 12 hours, the night had 12 hours, but they didn't have good clocks. So the hours stretched in the summer and they shrank in the winter. And that you might find a bit confusing. The days of the week are rather arbitrary, and the seven-day week almost certainly predates the writing of Genesis. The Bible was written in a society that already had a seven-day week. Other societies, the Dogon people of Mali today in North Africa, they still work off a five-day week. Every society needs a week, because what's happening with a week? Until very recently, almost everybody lived a rural life. 
And if you're living an agrarian rural life, you don't have contact with very many people on a daily basis. And so on a regular basis, you want to gather for social reasons, for market, and for religious reasons. And those are not independent, they're coupled. So the society needs something like a week. Now, why do we have a seven day week? Some people speculate that it's because it's about a week between new moon and first quarter, first quarter and full. A more probable reason, and this is conjecture, but probable, is that the reason there are seven days is because there are seven planets. But planet has a special meaning now. It comes from a Greek word meaning wanderer. You know that yourselves if you do any engineering from planetary gears, which wobble. The planets are anything in the sky that moves through the stars, and that's Mercury and Venus, not the Earth. The Babylonians didn't know the Earth was a planet. Mercury and Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, the sun and the moon. And they asked the question, why do the planets move through the stars? And they had a perfectly good answer to that. The planets are gods and they do as they please. And so this was their religion. The planets were the gods. There were seven of them. They were Saturn, the most powerful god, because Saturn takes 30 years to move through the sky. We now know that's because that's how long it takes to orbit the sun. They didn't know that. And of course, the most powerful god does the least moving. Just like in any corporation, the boss sits at a big desk in a chair and bosses everybody else around, and the cleaner has to rush around and do all the jobs at high speed. So the powerful god moves slowly, next powerful, and so on. These are the times these things take to move through the sky. The sun reflects the Earth's motion down to the fastest that is the moon. Now you may be thinking, oh yeah, but isn't Jupiter the king of the gods, classically? Saturn had a prophecy that he would to be usurped by one of his offspring, so he ate his children. And you're not surprised to hear that his wife was not pleased. Various myths, but in one of the myths she makes him ill, she makes him sick, and he brings the children back up. Here's Goya's terrible renditions of those from the Prado Museum in Madrid of, oops, of Saturn chewing up his children. But anyhow, his wife makes him sick, he brings them back up, and Jupiter is mighty angry and takes over and becomes the king of the gods, or Jove in the Roman tradition. Well, because they were so religious, the Babylonians gave every hour of every day to one of their gods. The first hour of the first day belonged to Saturn. And that was Saturn's day. Second hour to Jupiter, then Mars, Sun, Venus, Mercury, and Moon, and then down through the list again and again and again until the first hour of the next day belonged to the Sun. Saturn's day, Sun's day. And then through the list again, the next, first hour of the next day was Moon's Day. So they had Saturn's Day, Sun's Day, Moon's Day. Is this beginning to sound familiar? Uh, but now don't you think we had a problem? Let's keep skipping three. Saturn's Day, Sun's Day, Moon's Day, Mars's Day, Mercury's Day, Jupiter's Day, and Venus's Day. What happened? There's the list as it looks to us, but any of you speak any Romance languages? In French, lundi, mardi, mercredi, judi, vendredi. Spanish, lunes, mar martes, mercoles, jueves, viernes. You can see the planets there. Why not in English? Because Hagar the Horrible and all of his friends came to Lancashire where I live. They brought their genes with them and they brought their gods with them. And they kept the same pattern, but their god too, Woden, Thor, and Freya substituted to give us Saturn's Day, Sun's Day, Moon's Day, Tuesday, Woden's Day, Thor's Day, and Freya's Day. We have had an unbroken week in Western culture for 1,800 years. 1,800 years ago in Europe, it was Friday. Nothing else in the calendar has remained fixed like that. Oh. Well, you look at that nice picture of East San Juan, and let me tie my shoelace so I don't fall on my face while I'm talking to you. Obviously, we're in South Africa, and I have a story to tell, and in fact, I see two companions in the audience who've been to East San Juan with me. We went to visit this battlefield and walk through the battle and be told the story by the great raconteur historian David Rattray when he was alive. Absolutely marvelous. I hope some of you had that experience too. 22nd of January, 1879, summertime, it's hot. The British army encamped at the base of this hill has a commander who's put up no battlements, he's dug no trenches, he feels so superior to the Zulus that he feels unthreatened. 
Of course, Cetuayo has been pushed to the point of intolerance by the British government breaking its promises over and over. And that morning, the numbers vary, but in one account, 8,000 Zulus come over the hill. The battle rages through the day, and the British army is essentially wiped out. It was their biggest defeat in colonial history. The Zulus lost 2,000 men, too. They lost even more than the British did. The few survivors ran down the hill behind, and we walked that with David Rattray. It's eight kilometers down the hill to the Buffalo River, which was in flood. The few survivors made it across the river. They did lose the Queen's colors, much to their disgrace. And then, because it was in flood, the Zulus didn't follow, but they shouted across the river to some men who weren't part of the battle, kill those men, or we know where you live, we'll come get you when this river comes down. And so Captains Coghill and Melville were killed at that point. They're buried there. The rest of the survivors made it downriver to Rourke's Drift, the hospital, which had been raised down to knee level overnight. The battle continued through the night, but by morning, everybody was tired. The Zulus let the few survivors live, and more Victoria Crosses were given for that battle than any other British battle. So they're completely fixated on it, even still today, for those who like military history. <clears throat> when we were visiting there, David Rattray said to me he had heard that there was an eclipse during the battle. He had sat in the huts of old Zulu men who had fought in that war, and they had told him there was an eclipse of the sun. And he asked me if that was true. He didn't know. Well, I looked it up. There was. Here's a picture of the to ah, come on of the eclipse. It started over here in South America, came across the Atlantic. It was total in Namibia, up here through Botswana, Zambia, up into Tanzania. Down in Zululand, it was about 55%. And the Zulus noticed that, the sun being covered. The few British survivors never even uh, noticed. When that happens, if you're in a partial eclipse, it just gets a bit darker, and clouds do that too. So unless you're carefully watching, people can miss a partial, especially if they're fighting for their lives. So there was a total eclipse, and Ryder Haggard heard about it. He was in KwaZulu-Natal, and that led him to make that the center of his story, King Solomon's Mines. Now, I admit Ryder Haggard is no longer politically correct. He was a writer of his times. I still enjoy his books, but you do have to be careful who you recommend them to because of the way they're written from those imperial times. Do you know, for those of you, if you haven't read Writer Haggard, and some of you might not have, you've probably seen the movies. They're called Indiana Jones. Uh, you know, you, you watch an Indiana Jones movie, and you can see she, you can see Alan Quatermain, you can see the stories going through the tunnels and the volcanoes, and the, at the end, the bad woman completely disintegrating when she's no longer immune to time. Writer Haggard, in King Solomon's Mines, had on June 2nd after sundown, in the east there's a glow, then the bent edge of silver light, and at last the full bow of the crescent moon rise above the plain. Not on planet Earth and not on any other planet in the universe, not on any exoplanet. If the sun's going down over there and the moon's rising over there, the sun's shining on the moon as you see it, that's full moon. And if you haven't noticed that yet in your life, full moon rises at sunset. The crescent moon is over there just to be seen just after sunset or just before sunrise at the end of the month. This is impossible. And then Ryder Haggard, the next day, has a full moon. So his crescent moon's whipped across the sky, but it's delayed by about four hours in rising. And the following day, the moon whips across the sky and passes in front of the sun. And the eclipse lasts for an hour, and the longest a total eclipse can last is seven minutes. So astronomers ridiculed him, and if you want to actually see that, you have to get the first edition, because he did patch it up. This is impossible. Why did he put it in there? Because his hero has gone up, uh, at least in my mind, up to modern-day Tanzania. He's been captured by a local tribe, and they're going to kill all the Europeans, but with the prediction of the eclipse, um, the Africans are so amazed that they're allowed to survive, and that was central to his story. Haggard's not the only one who should have taken astronomy classes from me before he became a famous writer. Edgar Allan Poe, fellow American, if I put my American hat on, he had a story descent into the maelstrom, and he writes of a ship sailing off the Norwegian coast at a latitude of 68 degrees north on July 10th. And as the ship sails into the storm, Captain reads the time on his watch. 
at midnight by the light of the full moon, which is directly overhead. Well, the full moon never gets anywhere near that far north, but here's a picture I showed you before. I took this at midnight at that latitude on that date. Why was he reading his watch by the light of the full moon when the sun was still up? All right, well, not all writers misunderstand the moon. Thomas Hardy knows his stars. And if you go back and reread Far From the Matting Crowd, in the beginning when the disaster happens and Gabriel Oak's sheep are chased off the cliff by his dog gone crazy, uh, Thomas Hardy's describing the position of Orion in the sky, and he's got everything right. He knows what he's talking about. Why did I get into that? Because we want to talk about the moon. The moon is a terrible way to keep time. The moon takes 27.32 days to orbit the Earth, but because the Earth orbits the sun, the length of the month is 29.53 days, and that's how many months there are in a year. That's not a good way to keep track of the year. Well, the modern Islamic calendar is purely lunar, and there are exactly 12 months in the year of 29 and a half days. And that's why, if you're not Muslim yourself, you probably don't keep track of why Ramadan drifts through the calendar we use, and Dulhija, when people go on Hajj, drifts through the calendar, because their calendar's short. By the way, they, they keep track of this 0.03 days here, in that, on average, every two and a half years, the Muslim calendar has a leap day. The Jewish calendar is lunar, too. The month is exactly 29.53 days, but by remarkable coincidence, there are exactly 235 months in 19 years. If I multiply 19 by 12, there should be 228 months. And so what the Jewish calendar does is some years have 12 months and some years have 13, and over 19 years it all comes back together again. So the moon is not a good timekeeper. That's not what we're going to use for the calendar. The year, the time it takes the Earth to go around the sun is a little over 365 and a quarter days, but that's not what we use for the year, because the Earth is spinning like a top and it's tilted, and the pull of the moon and the sun on the bulge of the Earth causes the Earth to process, it wobbles, once every 25,800 years. And that shortens the time from the vernal equinox to the vernal equinox, the tropical year, to 365.2422 days. And that's the thing we've been trying to build a calendar on, not completely successfully even now, for more than 2,000 years. Our calendar begins with the Roman Republican calendar. This is before the Caesars, before the empire. And you'll notice the names of the month. The beginning of the year was in Martius, that remained true here in Cape Town until 1752. We'll come back to that. Martius, Operalis, Maius, Unius, you recognize those. And then the months were just 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And we've kept 7, 8, 9, 10. What happened to 5 and 6? I'll tell you in a moment. But there were 12 months in a year, not just 10. And some bright spark realized the moon kept going around. We better have a couple more months. So they invented Januarius and Februarius, and they put them at the end of the year. And poor old February got shortchanged, as it always has throughout history. The year's 10 and a half days short. They were using lunar months. And so every three years or so, they threw in an extra month. And they threw it in after February the 23rd. Nobody knows why. But what happens to you next month if on February 23rd we have another month and then we go to February 24th? Is that going to confuse any of your plans? <laughs> yeah, it sure might. So the last five days of February came after the leap month. Now, in Roman England, where I, in fact, I lived there, nice Roman rooms where I am, and England and its colonies, March the 25th was the start of the year, and that lasted till 1752. As you traveled around the Roman Empire, you didn't just travel from place to place, you traveled from time to time. And the political reason for that, if you think about it, tax day was March the 25th, first day of the year. If you're the ruler, say, in the Levant, where modern-day Israel, Lebanon is, and your tax coffers have gone dry, you've got no money to pay bills, and you need to collect the taxes again, but this year you're supposed to have an extra month, well, the local ruler might just say, well, I'm not going to have that extra month. I can't stand the delay. Forget the month. We're going to have March 25th roll around and collect the taxes. And so that differed by different local rulers, and the calendar varied from place to place, not just time to time. The months were lunar, and the first day of the month, first couple days, were the calendi. We still call them the calends. They were unlucky. The middle of the month was called the Ides, 
And in Shakespeare's version of Julius Caesar's assassination, the soothsayer says, beware the Ides of March. And there's a picture of the evildoers, Brutus and his gang, stabbing Caesar to death. Well, the soothsayer said, beware the Ides of every month. They weren't always on the 15th, but they were around full moon. It depended on the month, 15th to 13th. They also had gnomes on the 7th to the 5th. And Roman keeping track of dates is terrible. You look and they don't, they don't, wouldn't call this the 25th of the month. They'd call it five days before the calends, or they would call it 10 days after the Ides. And to get the difference between dates, very confusing. But the Romans were terrible with numbers anyhow. Have you ever tried to multiply uh, XVII times LX? Doing arithmetic with Roman numerals is also difficult. They weren't, uh, until we got rid of that, there wasn't going to be much progress. So the soothsayer presumably has his ear to the ground. He knows there's a possibility of an assassination, and he's going to tell Caesar to, bear, uh, to beware the Ides any month, but in March, because he knows it's coming. Now, our calendar arose out of the Julian calendar, thanks to Julia, Julius Caesar, or at least to him ordering somebody to do it. The vernal equinox is the time of spring in the northern hemisphere. That's the autumnal equinox here in the southern hemisphere, March the 25th, not 21st. We'll come back to that. It was March the 25th. Start of spring in the northern hemisphere, equal days and nights over the entire planet. And by 46 BC, that equinox was differing on the calendar from the true equinox by three months. So Julius Caesar hired an astronomer named Sosigenes. He was Greek, but from Alexandria, so African, to revise the calendar. And in this picture, I'm showing you a bust of Caesar, and you can find those all over the ex-Roman Empire. They're common. What did Sosigenes get? Oh, in my opinion, he got much more. We astronomers gave him a crater on the moon. So there's crater Sosigenes. And what did he decide? This is going to look familiar. The year is 365 days long, but every four years, throw in another one. That gets you 365 and a quarter. That originally threw it in between February 23 and 24 for reasons unknown, but that's where the extra month used to be. And at least it drifted to the end of February. Haven't you ever wondered why we have leap day in February? Wouldn't it be better just to put it after December 31st? And well, every, the whole world would get Tweet Anuviar then, and the Cape, <laughs> the Cape would get a Dare Anuviar. Well, it's still at the end of February. Sosigeny said January 1st is the beginning of the year. But as you've noticed well in the history of South Africa, governments can declare whatever laws they like. If the people don't want to obey them, it doesn't stick. And the people didn't like that. They stuck with March the 25th. And the months were alternating 30 and 31 days except February. Well, following that, Tiberius came along. And Tiberius was a real terror. He was a horrible person. Now, this is a picture from his palace in Capri. I took that just looking at this little platform, which is a beautiful place to go and stand and look down into the Mediterranean. What Tiberius did, where that platform was in his time, there was no railing. And for entertainment, he would have teenage boys thrown off that, and he would watch them fall to their deaths. He also was so stupid, he couldn't count to four. And so he had leap year every three years and messed the calendar up, and it wasn't in until Claudius came in with a whole lot better brain that Claudius then skipped some New Year's and got things fixed up. But with the Julian calendar, the year 46 BC had an extra three months, and they knew that as the year of confusion. And it's similar to the argument I just gave you. If we throw in an extra three months in 2019, many of you in here are retired, you're okay. But if you're running a business, if you're running a university, oh, well, actually for UCT for the last three years, an extra three months might be useful. But in general, it's confusion. Well, the Romans didn't call that year 45 BC. C hadn't happened. They didn't know they were B. They did their counting from the mythical founding of Rome, and that's a picture I took of Romulus and Remus being suckled by the she-wolf up on Capitoline Hill. You can find that monument. So they were counting from about 750, what we call BC, from the founding of Rome. What happened with Quintilus and Sextilis? Well, when Julius Caesar died, the Senate voted to change the name of the month Quintilus to Julius. We call it July. It did have 31 days. The next month, which should have had 30 days, was then later named after Augustus. Being a great emperor, he couldn't have a short month, so they gave that one 31 days too. 
And then Caligula tried to name September after his father Germanicus. Well, Germanicus was the great Roman emperor who protected the Roman Empire from the incursion from the Huns. He was loved by the people. And at least if you believe Robert Graves' history of the Roman Empire, it's thought that Caligula and his mother, that is, um, Germanicus' wife, murdered Germanicus, and the people simply wouldn't accept the change of name. And so we don't have June, July, Germanicus. We've still got June, July, and then we go back to seventh month, September. 30 days hath September, April, June, and November. How hard did that get pounded into your little brains when you were children? Why? Who ordered that? And the answer is, at first, it was simple. 3130, 3130, 3130. Just nice alternating to keep it averaging. And March was the beginning of the year. January and February got shifted. But 3130, 3130, and then Augustus got an extra day. That got stolen for poor old February, and that messed up the pattern. But that's what gave you the 30 days half September. Time still flies, though, and nobody's done anything about the length of the year. It's too long. 365 and a quarter days, but there's the length of the year, 11 minutes and 14 seconds less. And so over the years, the vernal equinox drifted to the 21st of March, where it essentially is now. We lost three days. Do the farmers care if the calendar's got the time of spring wrong in the northern hemisphere? No. Farmers are planting based on the weather. They can read the weather, they can read the seasons, they can read the land. The people who cared are the priests. The priests want to set their holidays. And when I say priests now, I mean in the church, and the the church then is the Christian church, the only one. And so the priests gather in Nicaea. So the area is still called Nicaea in modern-day Turkey. The town there is Iznik, which has got these beautiful tiles, uh, for those of you who have been to Turkey. And they have the Council of Nicaea, and their main goal is to set the date of Easter, which is the second most important feast day in the Christian calendar. Now, I know you probably are confused because Easter wanders all over the calendar. Here's the rule they made. Easter is to be on the Sunday following essentially the full day of the moon, not quite, 14.76 would be the full moon, but it's the Sunday following the full moon following the vernal equinox, which they set on the 21st of March. And they did try to make sure that wasn't on Passover just so they weren't sharing a feast day with the Jews. They didn't do anything about the length of the year. And that 11 minutes and 14 seconds keeps piling up so that by 1472, the calendar had shifted by another 10 days. Pope Sixtus IV, and you probably know Pope Sixtus, I'll tell you why in just a moment, hired Johann Muller, he's known by his Latin name Regiomontanus, to modify the calendar. And he was assassinated. Why would somebody assassinate some obscure poor astronomer who's just trying to fix the calendar? Well, if you think about it today, apologies to those of you who are Catholic, but Catholicism, the church, is polytheistic. There are all these saints who've got supernatural powers, and people pray to their saints. And what happens if you're praying to your saint on your saint's day, and somebody changes the calendar, and your saint's not listening? This is pretty serious stuff. You can't mess with people's religions. And so Johann Muller's assassinated. I put in the Sistine Chapel because Sixtus is the pope after whom it's named. Sistine is just the adjectival form of Sixtus. When I go to Rome, I have been in the Sistine Chapel, but it's so insanely crowded. It's such a hassle to get in there. The next time you go into St. Peter's in Rome, if you go to the right-hand nave, the first chapel's got Michelangelo's Pieta. Of course, plex plexiglass, bulletproof, because it got attacked decades ago, and hordes of people. But if you go to that chapel and then turn left down the right-hand nave and just go a few chapels along, you come to the chapel of Gregory the 13th, and there he sits on his throne, with his geometer here and his astronomer peering at the sky and his learned men with their books. And he's the one who finally got the calendar reformed to the calendar that we use today. It's called the Gregorian calendar after Gregory the 13th. 1582, Gregory hired Luigi Giraldi, who died of natural causes. And then the calendar reforms fixed finally by Christopher Clavius. The Julian year, 
from Roman times is too long by one day in 128 years. And so what the Gregorian calendar, what Clavius finally decided to do, was every four years is a leap year, unless it's divisible by 100. So 1600, 1700, sorry, 1700, 1800, and 1900 were not leap years. But that takes too many days out. So every 400 years, go ahead and have the leap year. So 2000 was. 2100 won't be, 2200 won't be, 2300 won't be, 2400 will be. And that gets the, cl the calendar good to only a matter of a few seconds. It's now much, much better. Well, Christopher Clavius has an honor to him. It's a crater on the moon. And the science fiction author Arthur C. Clarke, some of you read his stories, those of you interested in science fiction. Uh, I was acquainted with Arthur, and on a trip to Sri Lanka once where he was chancellor of the university and where he lived, I visited him in his house and had a good day talking to him, and then he loaned me and a friend his secretary in a car, and we drove around Sri Lanka in the middle of the war 30 years ago. Went to a diving hotel that Arthur owned that nobody was in, and he just called up his staff and said, you've got two tourists coming, opening up, and was very hospitable. Well, Arthur liked to put science in his stories, and so in his story, The Sentinel, which then later became the movie 2001, A Space Odyssey, Clark put the monolith from the alien civilization in Crater Clavius to connect to the reform of the calendar. If you look here, this is Stanley Kubrick, the movie maker's view of what the Earth would look like from the moon back in the early 60s before astronauts had ever been there, before any satellites had been there. And we've been now, and boy, the movie makers weren't bad. They did a good job of imagining what the, moon, the Earth would look like from the moon. They're from a Japanese satellite is the real thing. But the vernal equinox had drifted. And it had drifted so far that Pope Gregory declared the fifth of the month in 1582 would be followed by the 15th. 10 days pulled out of the calendar. 1582, we are now post Martin Luther and post Henry VIII. The Catholic countries changed their calendar, but not the Protestant countries. And the 11 minutes and 14 seconds continues to accumulate more and more and more until finally in England and its colonies by 1752, the calendar's off by 11 days. So Parliament 1752 declares the 2nd of September will be followed by the 14th. They also declare that the next year, 1753, will start on January the 1st, and that took. 1752 had no January, no February, no, no March 1st through 24th. Those, those dates never existed. And so historians refer to old style and new style when they're using dates. And I mentioned to you earlier, Isaac Newton is claimed to have been born in January of um, 1642, but his parents thought that that was Christmas 1641. So it depends on the calendar you use. You do have to keep track of which calendar you're giving dates for. This taking 11 days out of the calendar led supposedly to the English time riots. This is an urban myth. But the myth was that people thought that they had had 11 days stolen from their lives. And they wanted their 11 days back. That seems ridiculous, but when I was an undergraduate in San Diego in the early 1960s, when San Diego would go on summertime, you don't do that here in Cape Town, but you know other countries do, advance the clock one hour so that you get up, essentially you get up out of bed an hour earlier and then you've got an hour extra daylight in the evening. But with that advance of the uh, time in San Diego, we would get a call every year from a local woman who was incensed, she was angry with us and she wanted us to stop changing the clocks because the extra hour of daylight was burning her garden and ruining her grass. <laughs> and it, we can't change the length of the day, and these people didn't you lose 11 days out of their lives. So where did this myth come from? I've tracked down the answer to that. I did not mean myself, but I've found where other people have talked about it. The source is now known. In London, one of the most eclectic museums, in fact, one of the most eclectic museums in the world is called the Sir John Soane's Museum. Sir John Soane was a great architect, uh, the architect of the Bank of England and many other monolithic buildings in the city of London. Very wealthy. He had a beautiful big house on Lincoln's Inn Fields in London. And that house he bequeathed to the nation with all of his art collection, with his antiquities, to remain as it was when he died. 
And a couple centuries later now, it's hardly been changed. The, his will's mostly been obeyed. It's free, and I can't recommend it more highly to you. Just go and explore this magnificent house of his that's now a museum. And in one room, he's got the Hogarth paintings. The Hogarth paintings are big. They're not quite as big as the picture on the screen, but they're approaching that size. And so they don't all fit in the room. They are stacked and they're on hinges. And you take your time of day, you can ask when it will be. The curator will come in and open the paintings so you can see the ones behind. And this one is a painting of the people just getting absolutely blotto because of the loss of this 11 days from their life. They're drunk. They're wildly partying. Back here, some man's got a chair in his hand. Looks like he's about to smash the window. Uh, you don't want to look too closely at what some of these men and women are doing with each other. This guy's completely drunk sitting on the floor, and somebody else is pouring a jug of wine over his head. And underneath this man's foot is a poster that's fallen to the floor. And in the picture I've got, the resolution doesn't fully show it, but it says, give us our 11 days. And Hogarth was just having fun with this. And yet an urban myth arose which still permeates in England to where people think there actually were time riots. Now your tax day comes September. You have to file your tax returns. Well, it changed things here in South Africa because of Southern Hemisphere and the seasons. But in England and its colonies, tax day originally was the 25th of March, the first of the year, until 1753. 1753, when March the 25th came around, the government said to the bankers, pay up. And the bankers said, uh uh, wait a minute. It's not been a year since you last took money from us. You wait another 11 days. And in a confrontation between bankers and the government in England, who wins? Uh, plus a change. The bankers win. <laughs> Nothing's changed. And so the government waited another 11 days, and in England now the tax year starts on April the 6th. In Russia, they still use the Julian calendar. The Orthodox Church is so not the government, but the Orthodox Church has never left it. And so Christmas Day on the Julian calendar, you have to wait 13 days the calendar shifted now. So Russian Orthodox Christmas is on the 7th of January on the calendar that we use. And their new year follows after that. They've never gone on to the Gregorian calendar, for the church at least. I've got a picture which is a little too blurry to show you, but I will describe it. It's of a gravestone on the Isle of Jura in Scotland. And on the gravestone, it says that the man celebrated 186 Christmases. And no person has ever lived 186 years. And indeed, he didn't. He celebrated Julian and Gregorian Christmases his whole life. <laughs> it was common on the island. So he only had to make half that age. Well. There's a character you may know, the Hatter from Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. And I will remind you that the Hatter was tried before the Queen of Hearts, and he sang, and his voice was so bad, she said that he murdered time. And time himself was so incensed that he stopped time for the Hatter. So it was perpetually 6 p.m. tea time. Well, time stopped for the Hatter, but it hasn't stopped for me, ladies and gentlemen, or you. Not only the lecture, but the entire series has finally come to an end. Thank you very much for your attention. It's about time I stop. I hope you notice I've left a few minutes for questions, but there is also a concert coming. I'm not at all offended if you want to squeeze out for your concert. But if you've got questions, let me bring the lights up so we can see each other. And as always, I'll take questions. There we go, that's better. And don't tell me you didn't think of any questions with all of that. Right, okay, it's off, I was going to say it's off to the concert. Yes, sir. Oh, well. The question was, is it possible to calculate the date of Easter, or do you have to look it up? But if you go look it up, it's because somebody calculated it. <laughs> so the answer is, yes, it is possible to calculate it. You need to know when the vernal equinox is. You need to know the phases of the 